Continuing our conversation, our guest on This is America and the World is David Ignatius. He's the award-winning foreign affairs columnist for the Washington Post, former executive editor of the International Herald Tribune, and former reporter with the Wall Street Journal. David Ignatius is also the author of 11 spy thrillers, his latest, The Paladin. I, I do think, I just want to underline what from a military standpoint, saying to the Taliban, okay, we'll take control of the city would have meant, again, just to control the airport, a relatively small area, required 5,000 troops, and even then it wasn't all that secure. So imagine a city of 10 million, and you know, this is a city that we've failed in 20 years to fully stabilize and secure. Well, were you really going to do it uh, you know, overnight because the Taliban asked us? I think that's what any commander would have thought. Uh, and it's, and it's, yeah, I don't think that's unreasonable. Lessons learned, huh? Well, there's so many lessons learned. Um, I, uh, I, I, as I said at the outset, Dennis, the biggest lesson for me is, is one about the limits of military power. Uh, I learned a, another lesson that I tried to share with readers last week, which is the story of how the CIA, which we remember was the first in Afghanistan after 9-11 when, you know, we, we were just so bruised as a country, the CIA sent in a small number of case officers and recruited uh, an army of Afghan tribal leaders. Uh, and they quickly toppled the Taliban from power in, in Kabul. And then they they formed up what they called counterterrorism pursuit teams made up of Afghans to chase the remnants of Al Qaeda, which were still a threat. And they felt a deep sense of loyalty to those teams, which then continued to operate for most of the last 20 years. And as I wrote last week, they got every single one of those so called CT, PT is what they call them. But uh, every one of those Afghan partners and their families, more than 20,000 people out. Mm. So this is a time when you know, America had trouble delivering its promises to Afghanistan and failed. Here's one small story of us keeping a promise to people who helped us in our main job in Afghanistan, which was chasing Al Qaeda and the way we tried to, to keep faith with them. With the uh, CIA out, uh, how do we keep an eye on Al Qaeda or ISIS K? I mean, how do how do we how do we know what's going on within the country now? So the honest answer is that we're going to have trouble doing that effectively. Uh, there's a lot of talk about over the horizon capabilities, and I've begun to roll my eyes at that a little bit. Um, mm. You know, the, the, uh, we have um, surveillance assets in the sky. We, we have surveillance drones that you know, we've gotten very good at the art of snooping, uh, looking in every you know, mountain valley and craggy fortress and, you know, listening, translating, intercepting every message we can. So uh, all the tools of intelligence will be uh, employed. And the expectation is that although Al Qaeda may reform cells, it's unlikely that major operations, which require numbers of people, that requires things that you can see and hear, uh, given our modern surveillance skills and our focus, focus on that, on that region, uh, that, that we'll be able to detect something big, something that would strike the homeland. And, you know, let, let's remember too, um, we're a lot better protected than we were. Every time you go to an airport, every time you go anywhere, uh, you're aware of how much greater security is. So we're, we're a harder target to hit now than we were. But the, the idea that we're not going to face a future threat from an ungoverned, lawless Afghanistan, yeah, I just don't believe it. I think we are going to face threats. Let me take another uh, little break here, David. Uh, talking... Uh, with uh, David Ignatius, um, a foreign affairs columnist for The Washington Post, one of the great writers, and we're lucky to have him with us today. Take a little break. Back on the other side, this is America 
and the world. Underwriting for This is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. The Republic of Uzbekistan. The Sultanate of Oman. The Kingdom of Morocco. The National Association for Children of Addiction. Faces and Voices of Recovery. The Forerunner Foundation, the Rotondaro Family Trust, and the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy. Uh, David, let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about China and Russia. Uh, uh, Xi and Putin, what are they up to? What should we know? Well, let's start with China and President Xi Jinping because I think there's a consensus uh, among uh, foreign policy experts that that's the real challenge to the United States. And we've never, in our modern history, faced a challenge like China, a country that's as sophisticated technologically as we are, that's as economically dynamic as we are. And the old Soviet Union wasn't anything remotely like that. President Xi Jinping inherits a China that's just rocketing ahead uh, thanks to its experiment with capitalism rolled by the Chinese Communist Party. And surprisingly to me, uh, over the last uh, uh, year, he's been making a real leftward turn. Uh, he's been putting that dynamic Chinese market, uh, the, the fantastic Chinese internet companies, Alibaba, mm -hmm. Tencent, uh, names that... Uh, some of our viewers may be familiar with. He, he's been putting them under much tighter government control. Uh, he's made it much more difficult for them to raise money. Uh, he, he's decided that uh, the internet was creating disparities in wealth and power that were unacceptable. So uh, that Chinese uh, dynamic economy is gonna be different going forward. Will it begin to slow? Is she making a, a, just a classic mistake? Uh, it's too early to know. Mao made a catastrophic mistake. Mao, with his so-called Great Leap Forward, practically bankrupted China, created famines across the country that, that killed millions and millions of, of Chinese. Uh, I, I wrote a column recently that you can't go to China and talk to Chinese people who don't remember bitterly the Maoist cultural revolution that, that came after the, the Great Leap Forward, where every intellectual, every middle class person, every educated person was was shamed and humiliated, was sent to the farms, mm. broken. Uh, so are we heading toward a period like that again, which which every Chinese you're at my age remembers uh, with just just horror? Uh, if that happened, it would it would set back China's advance, and we need to be very careful in watching it. The other thing to say about China is Xi Jinping wants to control Taiwan. Mm. He has set that as a goal for himself. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. thinks of it as Ch Chinese do, as part of China. And although Taiwan has a separate democratic government, she would like to bring Taiwan fully under Beijing's control, as he seems to have brought Hong Kong, which was once an independent place now under 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 Beijing's control, but that's that's potentially dangerous. So, those would be the things I'd keep my eye on. Is is the Chinese economy going to continue to grow? It's heading toward dominance in many key technologies. Uh, is is she going to uh, uh, continue that process, or or is he going to obstruct it? And what's he going to do about about Taiwan? Russia, I think, is um, a, a country that. To, to, tries to intimidate uh, uh, other, other countries, especially us, but countries in Europe. Uh, but its fundamental economic power is is extremely limited. It's it's still basically a, an energy exporting economy. Its other economic sectors have not grown. It's extremely corrupt. I mean, almost everything is for sale in Russia, uh, including political influence. 
Putin is a, a, an autocrat. He likes to live well. His friends live well. The Washington Post and other newspapers just today, as we're speaking, uh, ran a series about the, the theft of, of billions of dollars from Russia uh, to buy fancy apartments in Monaco and the properties here and there. So I think Russia has the, the, the power to cause trouble for us militarily. It's, it's a nuclear superpower. But in terms of the fundamentals of power, the, the kind of challenge that China poses, it's, it's nowhere near as, as, as important a problem. I think if, if I, if I, my guess is that Biden is going to seek a, a dialogue with Russia, understanding that there's a language of arms control that he can use to, to speak with the Russians. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a deal uh, eventually over the next year about Syria. I think China is the, the harder problem. There really isn't a, a, any meaningful dialogue going on between Biden and Xi. Uh, it's been it's been very sharply antagonistic. So. Uh, I, I think your you know, viewers should um, be less worried about Russia and more worried about China. Uh, as I was preparing some notes for our conversation, I said with the Biden foreign policy now, and as you have uh, sketched out for us uh, rather eloquently that uh, people in the United States don't want these wars overseas, uh, what would happen if uh, China and they've been buzzing around uh, Taiwan in the last few days. What would happen if China attacked Taiwan? What would happen if Russia made a move to go into Estonia or Ukraine? How, how would we react? So uh, it's taking them in reverse order. Um, we have a commitment uh, through NATO that we will come to the defense of NATO members, including the Baltic states, and we're treaty bound to protect them. So if they were attacked, um, we would have an obligation under that treaty to come to their aid, including militarily, uh, up to the point of risking war, risking ultimately a nuclear war with Russia to honor our treaty commitments. Uh, are those treaty commitments entirely believable? Would we really sacrifice Chicago to save uh, Estonia or Lithuania? In a, uh, who can answer that in the, in the end? That's the riddle of NATO. But, you know, all, over the history of NATO, and the alliance has been around since 1945, it's been a credible uh, promise. We do not have a similar treaty obligation to Taiwan. Uh -huh. And although we have deep sympathy, I've traveled to Taiwan. Taiwan's a wonderful place. And if you want to go to a place that makes you feel like democracy is still worth the trouble, you could take a trip <laughs> to Taiwan. Taiwanese love their democracy. But we don't have a, a, a treaty commitment to them. And our policy has always been described as strategic ambiguity. We're not going to tell China what we do. We want them to have to worry about it. There are a lot of things we could do. We have a lot of military power we could bring into the theater. The Chinese now have weapons that could take out our aircraft carrier task forces, could take out a lot of the other uh, assets that we have. I, I would note that something really interesting, Dennis. So I'm sure your viewers uh, noted this new deal we just made to build nuclear powered submarines for Australia. <laughs> So one of the few areas where we have a real advantage is underwater, our undersea technology, ah. our, the quiet of our submarines are very hard to detect. And as the number of submarines, American, British, Australian, multiply in these waters around China, it's an important deterrent to actions they might take in Taiwan or the South China Sea, anywhere else. Hmm. But um, I think it's important that Americans not, I think it'd be a mistake to have a formal treaty with, with Taiwan. I think it's a mistake always to, to um, write checks that you're not sure you can cash. And I'm not sure the American people are ready to go to war for Taiwan. I'm not even sure they're ready to go to war for our NATO allies, but I hope they are because we we have a treaty commitment that says that. But we need to be careful about adding new commitments that might not be fully credible. You know, 
thinking about the southern border, uh, what you just raised with uh, uh, making the deal for the nuclear subs uh, with Australia, and that, uh, that did not make France very happy at all. Uh, no. There are, in Afghanistan, uh, putting all these things together, uh, our foreign policy is not looking very solid at the moment, huh? Uh, southern border, Haitian refugees, Afghanistan, France, Australia, it's its just messy, huh? Well, it is, it is messier than it should be. Um, and I've talked about my concerns about this period of American, uh, it's not a full retreat, but just withdrawal from parts of the world. But I mean, the obvious counter, and it's important for people to remember it, is we're lucky to have allies and partners all over the world. In the European countries, France may get angry at us about the submarine deal, but they're our ally. And they, what they really want is to be a better ally. The reason they were so upset is they felt dissed uh, as an ally. Uh, and and uh, similarly, uh, we have a, a great ally in Japan. Japan has been a steadfast partner for the United States. We're developing a fabulous relationship with India. Uh, there was just a meeting in Washington of the Quad, which is Japan, India, Australia, and the United States. That's a, that's a formidable for, for power, uh, I don't want to say it, it's not a formal military alliance, but it, but it's close to it. It's, part, it's a partnership. So all over the world, we have these countries that want to work with us, that look to us as still the most powerful military by far, and want to be our friends. China doesn't have anything like that. It would, it would like to. It's trying to mm. make, make friends, but it doesn't really have uh, allies. Ch the Chinese are just um, they, 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 they tend to alienate the countries uh, that, that, that they deal with. Uh, that's, that's true, um, certainly in Asia. Uh, it's true in, in Africa, Africa. the Middle East. They don't, they're, not, they're not very popular. They, do they try to buy, the same way. So, do they try to buy their friendships? Uh, I, I'm thinking now of Africa. Yes. They, they, I mean, I'm sure that there's money under the table, but in terms of money over the table, um, the Chinese have a program called the Belt and Road Initiative, where they're trying to offer economic development. Uh, if you'll go the Chinese way, uh, there are talk about strings attached. You're basically buying into Chinese logistical systems for everything forever uh, is the way they'd like they'd like to do it. And again, I think countries increasingly are resisting that. So. That's the big asset the United States still has in the game is that no matter we make a lot of mistakes, uh, we get pe people angry at us, we try wars that don't work out very well. But even so, after all of this, people still want to be associated with the United States. They mm -hmm. still want to send their kids to our universities. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. the lines to get a visa to America still or go around the block in almost every capital I can think of. So that's that's what we st that's our, what our national power still I think in as fundamental is is we have friends, partners, countries and people who want to be on our team basically. Uh, do we accept that uh, North Korea is a nuclear power and kind of get on with our day? <laughs> So we're, there's a de facto version of that. Nobody would want to formally uh, admit it. Um, the Biden administration decided just to kind of walk away from the problem and pretend for a while it doesn't exist. Um, Kim Jong-un is beginning to start firing off missiles. He doesn't like to be ignored for too long, and he won't be. Um, here's an area where I'd credit Donald Trump. I think Trump tried hard, and I, I was all for it. I think his efforts to, to see if he could explore a peace agreement with North Korea that would really denuclearize the, the North Korean Peninsula were were commendable. Sometimes they had ridiculous aspects of love letters with Kim Jong-un, but, but I, I thought that was good. I, th I thought President Trump's uh, initiatives that brought the Diplomatic relations between Israel and, and the UAE and Bahrain were, were really good. So it's not as if the only good foreign policy initiatives have been Biden's. Um, uh, and, and I, you know, at some point, the Biden administration is going to have to 
follow up what Trump tried to do with North Korea and get its own version started. Uh, you're involved in print journalism. Where does that fit in nowadays with people getting most of their news from television, radio, social media? Does fact matter anymore? Uh, how do you see it? Well, I mean, we're kind of in the dinosaur part of the business, I guess you could say. Um, fact does matter uh, when uh, it's crucial that, that you get the facts right. Uh, I got my start as a financial journalist working for the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal, where people have money at risk. They need to know what's true and what isn't, and they'll pay a lot of money uh, for reliable information. And as uh, information increasingly is manipulated, you know, we have fake news, thanks to technology, soon we'll have fake events. We'll literally have a fake David that you won't be able to distinguish uh, visually by sound from, from the real David. Um, and so we'll have fake events and that will be manufactured in the computer. So uh, knowing what's real, believable, what you can trade on in the financial markets, what you can vote on if you're a citizen, what you can make policy on if you're a policymaker. Imagine being a policymaker, being fed intelligence about the world and you don't know whether it's true or false. So that's the world we're heading for. The value of reliably accurate information is going to increase. It's one reason I'm hopeful about my business, uh, despite all its troubles. Social media, uh, disinformation, lies, hate, vitriol. Uh, that's a sad commentary, isn't it? I, it's just, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. You think of the dreams that people had for social media, the dream that initially Facebook was all about, let's connect the world and give people a, a platform to, to share. I've come to think, Dennis, that uh, social media, fa Facebook should be like any other publisher. Facebook is, is publishing um, uh, content online, making it available, distributing it. And uh, just as the Washington Post, New York Times does, uh, do. And uh, I think that in the end, uh, these social media platforms need to be liable for the truth or falsity uh, of, of the content that they publish, just as any other publisher is. So that's going to be a big change, would involve rewriting Section 230 of the Federal Communications mm. uh, uh, Act. But but I think that's the, the, the the step where people are going to have to consider. I mean, newspapers take the threat of a libel suit seriously. I've been an editor for many, many years, and I'm, I'll tell you, um, you know, we we, we take the threat of, of litigation seriously. That's why we check facts carefully. We don't want to get sued, and some. And if we if we've been reckless in what we present, we can lose a libel suit, and it can be very expensive. So I think. Social media platforms probably need to be in that same general universe. Exactly how the rules should work, I'm, I, I haven't thought about it carefully enough, but that, that's the way we need to be going. Hmm. Uh, latest novel, The Paladin. Uh, are you writing something? Uh, and that's a thriller, always. Uh, are you working on something new? I am slowly researching a new novel. Uh, my, I promised Dennis I'd love to come on your show and talk about it when I get uh, further along with it. It, it, it takes a while. Uh, this will be my 12th novel. Um, uh, at this point, uh, I, I want to make sure that I, I understand the characters and the plot. Um, and, uh, you know, it's if, if I keep thinking it's going to get easier, you know, at some point that you just hit the function key and it does it has like a <laughs> chapter one thing. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Last thing before we go, uh, you're experienced. Tell me something about life I should know. Well, so, I mean, I'll just be really sentimental. I just uh, celebrated the marriage of my youngest child. My third daughter was married in my uh, yard over the weekend and you know it was it was a moment of uh, of of joy and it just reminded me of what really matters and it isn't the work that i do for the washington post as important as i think that is it's 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 things like this and seeing seeing your children set sail in life and 
a sense of, of continuity. Um, as I say, that's really sentimental, but what matters in life, I was reminded this weekend, uh, as my, as my daughter, uh, uh, embraced her new husband, what, what, what matters is, uh, is those relationships. Beautiful. Congratulations to the, to the Thank couple you. and to you. Uh, you've been a good friend for a long period of time. Thank you for your time today, David. Uh, good to see you. It's it's great. I, I love being on your show. I always have. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, David. For information about This Is America and the World, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, or our YouTube channel, This Is America TV, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Underwriting for This Is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. The Republic of Uzbekistan. The Sultanate of Oman. The Kingdom of Morocco. The National Association for Children of Addiction. Faces and Voices of Recovery the Forerunner Foundation, the Rotondaro Family Trust, and the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy.